I just want to uh, very briefly, on behalf of the college, welcome you all to the event. This is, uh, well, we do lots of good events, but this is a particularly good one in a lot of ways, I think, in that it represents the intersection of, of many things that we care fairly deeply about at the college. Most broadly, uh, it is a good example of what we mean when we use the term useful education in liberal arts and sciences. People always say useful for what? And the answer is useful for the purposes of building a democracy. And certainly this kind of event, these kinds of questions and addressing them fall into that category. It's also uh, important to us because it reflects uh, something that I think is unusual about Dickinson among liberal arts colleges, and that is our very close relationship with the United States military. Uh, I think the claim could reasonably be made that there is no liberal arts college in America that in fact has a more collaborative relationship to the U.S. military than we do. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the fact that we host a distinguished ROTC unit here, which is unusual among our peer institutions. We have very close working relationships with the Army War College in multiple ways. Some of you may have participated in those, shared professorships, internships, and a whole variety of other things. And in fact, we're just finishing a half a million dollar grant from the Mellon Foundation precisely for the purpose of bringing other liberal arts colleges that happen to be near military higher education institutions together. We've been a leader in that based on the model of our collaboration with the War College. This also, I believe, uh, who's here in the audience, reflects our close relationship with uh, Roberto and Carlisle. Uh, we're very interested in place, and Carlisle is our place. We have with us today the borough manager, Matt Hanlon, and three members of the borough council, uh, Don uh, Flowers-Webb, Brent Landis, and Deborah Fulham Minston. So you might want to put your hands up for this time. Quick round of applause. And as we look back, the college is very interested in sustainability, and this is uh, exactly uh, the kind of event that we'd like to host in connection with that as well. And I want to thank the staff, Neil Leary, uh, Lindsay, and Ms. Lyons, and the staff of the Center for Sustainability Education for being the organizer. So, Without further ado, I want to uh, sort of turn uh, the front of the room, we don't have a page or a platform, but turn the front of the room over to uh, Katie Gibbert, one of our students, who will introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, my name is Katie Gimbert and I'm an Army ROTC cadet here at Dickinson College. On behalf of the Center for Sustainability Education, Security Studies, International Studies, Environmental Studies, and Dickinson ROTC, I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's talk, Preparing for the Future, Climate Change and National Security. In my own life, I have occupied both the environmental world and that of the Army. Every day I wake up at 0545 for PT before running across campus to my courses, where I study the imbalance between environmental injustices and the policies that guide it. While these worlds have seemingly conflicting motives, they both ultimately work to serve the global community. While studying in Australia, I saw the firsthand effects of the globe's rising temperatures on the fauna of the oldest rainforest in the world, the Daintree. The cassowary dates back to the time of the dinosaurs, and yet currently, their population count is plummeting. This can be attributed to the rising climate, which limits the availability of resources in regions the cassowaries can survive. It is, only, it is not only in the deep bush of Australia that you see this. This same phenomenon is affecting key leaders in their communities in rural regions of the mountainous Afghanistan and closer to home on the west coast of, United, of the United States. Today's speaker, Dr. David Tightly, served 32 years as an officer in the United States Navy, retiring at the rank of Rear Admiral. Some of his notable duties include Commander of the Naval Meteorology and Oceanography Command, Oceanographer and Navigator of the Navy, and Deputy Assistant Chief of Naval Operations for Information Dominance. In 2009, in addition to serving as Oceanographer and Navigator of the Navy, Dr. Tightly was selected as the Director of the Navy's newly created Task Force on Climate Change. 
The purpose of the, of the task force is to address the naval implications of a changing Arctic and global environment. In a TED talk Dr. Tightly delivered last year, he said, climate change is a risk to instability. He goes on to explain how both in the United States and abroad, the rising of sea levels affects food security, availability of clean water and energy. For our nation's military, these three factors, food security, clean water and energy, shape the area of operation. Upon retiring from the Navy, Dr. Tightly served as the Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce for Operations. This is the Chief Operating Officer position at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Dr. Tightly is currently Professor of Practice in Meteorology and a Professor of International Affairs at the Pennsylvania State University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tightly to Dickinson College. Th thanks, thanks so much, everybody. No, I'm not playing with my phone, but it turns out that if you ever are so honored and privileged to give a talk in here, there's no clock. And it uh, I am told that nobody wants to hear me talk until dinner time because we have lunch. And yes, I am aware that I'm between you and lunch, so, so I get that. So Provost, thanks so much for, uh, for hosting me at Dickinson College. This is a, this is a great turnout here. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to talk about pretty much what was said there, but I kind of call this people not polar bears. And I say that for a reason, because I hope that I can make this somewhat more human and a little bit less abstract than, uh, you know, sort of remote creatures that I'm guessing not too many of us have actually run into in the, uh, in the wild here. So before I start, let me just give a quick shout out, a quick uh, note of thanks to the American Security Project. Uh, they are the ones who organized and sponsored uh, this, this talk here. Certainly they were a major sponsor to this. So they've been around for over a decade. They're a nonpartisan, a nonprofit uh, think tank uh, specializing in national security issues. Founded by four senators, you can read the names up there, uh, two, two Republicans, two Democrats. And they're working really on what we would consider in the security community, really the issues of the day, all the way from Russia, nuclear, energy, and of course, uh, climate. So I just want to give them uh, uh, thanks for this. So I'll just give you a very quick introduction. Does anybody have any idea what this might be? It's a rain gauge. And why do I have that up there is because if you know only anything about me, I mean, yes, this is a very nice long introduction, but really all you need to know is I'm a recovering weather forecaster. Uh, so I have been interested in weather since about that tall, and if you don't believe me, my mom is in the back there, and, and she will verify that for you, uh, somewhere between kindergarten and first grade. Anyways, this was my pride and my joy at about fifth grade or so, we finally got a rain gauge. Uh, so I, knew, I had no idea about climate or the Navy or anything like that. I just knew I was going to do something with weather. So if you're going to do something with weather and you live in the Northeast, eventually you end up at Penn State, so that's where I ended up. That's not me on the right, but it could have been. So I was telling Katie that this is, you know, I went to college in a world where there was still only black and white. And uh, everything, in fact, was done by hand. And we looked at weather models and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, so my parents said, hey, congratulations, you made it to Penn State, now go figure out how to pay for it. Uh, so we also had Reserve Officer Training Corps, and uh, the Air Force said no, and the Navy said yes, I guess it worked out okay. But that's how I ended up in the Navy. I thought I was going to be in for, back then the obligation was four years, and since I was a great guy, I was on what I called the four-year-in-a-day program. So I was going to give the Navy one extra day and then get out and do weather. Uh, but a funny thing happened. Uh, it turns out that uh, I liked going to sea. I liked working with sailors. Uh, the mission is actually pretty cool. And so four years in a day turned into, well, as long as I'm still having fun and the Navy doesn't throw me out. And those condition, two conditions kind of stayed until about 32 years. Uh, Katie mentioned I went, worked for NOAA for a little while. And now I'm up at, uh, up at Penn State, primarily in their Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science but also I, I work uh, quite a lot with the School of International Affairs and the law school. Okay, so this is kind of what we'll go through in the next 35 to 40 minutes or so. Uh, really just some, some basics. I do have a little bit of science in here. I do not have that much uh, because very honestly, when people who really want to dig into the science, more times than not, it's what I call it's a proxy argument. 
It's a proxy argument to avoid having the real policy discussions. Now, having said that, if people have actual real science questions, I'm happy to go talk to them. I can, I can do that stuff. But uh, the issues are really, what are we going to do? Not debating what I call cutting edge 19th century science here. Uh, we'll talk about then climate as a risk, kind of some things to do at the macro level, but also at the individual level. I've just got one slide on energy, and, we'll, and then we'll wrap up here. OK, so when I think about climate risk, I'm, uh, I can't remember a whole lot of things at any one time. Has anybody read like the whole IPCC reports? They're only about like yay thick. Yeah. The National Climate Assessment, that comes in at a svelte 1,050 pages. It's only like yay thick. Yeah. Uh, three words. People, water, and change. This is not about polar bears. It's about people. It's about you and me and our families, our children, our grandchildren, uh, our neighbors, our aunts and our uncles, people who live in our towns and our villages and our cities in Pennsylvania, in our state and our country. This is fundamentally an issue that will affect everyone, either directly or indirectly. When I say indirectly, what do I mean by that? Those who aren't affected directly, guess what? You're going to pay. You're going to pay for, for dealing with this in one way, shape, or another. So it's about people. It's about water. This is a, a graph that I uh, got from the US Geological Survey. Uh, you may have seen it before in other contexts, but that big blue sphere uh, kind of sitting over Denver, that's if you took all the water of the world to scale of the earth and put it in a sphere uh, and put it over Denver. That's basically all the water in the, in the sea. That little one that's over Nashville, that's the amount of fresh water in the world. And maybe if you're in the front half of the room, you see that speck over Atlanta, that's the usable fresh water. So there's not a ton of it, but there is enough. Uh, but what happens as you change the climate is that you end up with uh, too much, too little, wrong place, wrong time. The water is now salty where it used to be fresh. Uh, it is uh, wet where it used to be dry. The water is liquid where it used to be solid as the ice melts. And even the chemistry itself of the ocean is changing as it basically absorbs the carbon dioxide. Uh, so I sometimes say that climate change is all about the water. You can certainly make an argument about heat and some other components, but I find that water encompasses a huge amount of the issues that we, people, care about. And then finally, I said it was people, water, change. So the change part is, you know, oftentimes I'll get somebody who says, hey, look, Titley, the, the climate's changed for many, many times before. It'll change many, many times again. What are you guys, what are you guys talking about? And if you look at scales like this, I'm just going to, you know, this is basically today, zero, right, before you uh, present. And this is almost half a million years ago. So long, long, long time frames, up, down, up, down. You can look at carbon dioxide concentrations, temperature, sea level, pick, pick your thing. They're all pretty, pretty correlated there. And yeah, on those kind of time frames, stuff changes a lot. Oh, by the way, in Q&A, if you want to know why it's changing like that, I can, I can tell you. We actually understand that. But if you kind of zoom in, and this is only 24,000 years, so where's 24,000? This is like, let's take this little piece here and blow it up. Not literally, not like in an army sense, blow it up. But blow up this one. Uh, I know, it's a war college thing. And what you see is you see, I, I just took sea level, but I could have taken temperature is you see the stability that we had for only about 8,000 years or so, eight, maybe 10,000 years. So what's happened in humans' history over the last eight to 10,000 years? We've only created civilization, right? Agriculture, civilization, the next thing you know, we're all walking around with these things, with, with iPhones. Uh, if you look at what the paleoanthropologists have told us, I think the last cognitive revolution was somewhere between 30 and 50,000 years ago. What were those people doing? Why didn't they have iPhones? I would argue in part, it was they were really just trying to survive very, very big climate change as, as we were coming out of a glacier. Not human cause, but big climate change nonetheless. And then we get to a part where we have stability. So stable climate does not mean ideal climate. We're all in Pennsylvania, right? I'm, a, I'm, in, I'm in State College. You know, you don't really see much of the sun between November and March. Uh, 
Hawaii and uh, San Diego, they have ideal climate. Every, all of the rest of us, we just had stable climate. So, but we knew what would plant. We knew when to harvest. We knew what would grow. We knew what critters we did and did not have to deal with. If we built a town or a village near the ocean edge, it stayed near the ocean edge. It didn't get flooded by 30 feet of sea level, nor did it find itself 50 kilometers inland. And we basically built human civilization on the premise of climate stability. We never really thought about it, but we just did that. So my message here really, because I see so many young people, so many students, undergrads, maybe some graduate students, is you and your children and your grandchildren will not have climate stability. You will be in an era, really regardless of our policies, of changing climate for decades, probably centuries to come. So all of the way we've done it in my generation and before is we've been able to look in the rear view mirror and kind of figure out what to build for, what to plan for. You can look in the rear view mirror all you want, but it's not gonna tell you much because the road has a whole lot of twists and curves in it coming up. So that's just something security wise, environmental wise, sustainability wise, food wise, water wise, uh, if you work in engineering, if you work with engineers, uh, don't let them just look back and add 10% for safety anymore, because that's what engineers do. Uh, they're going to need to look forward. We are all going to need to figure out different ways of looking forward. Okay, here's my science, and it's not too bad, I promise you. I know it's a liberal arts college. It'll be okay. Uh, so in my, in my kind of simple-minded ways of, you know, how do physical science people get understanding, I, I argue, and I've used this with the National Academy of Science, it's kind of a three-legged stool. You know, do we understand the basic theory, sort of like E equals MC squared, that kind of stuff? What do the observations tell us? And then finally, can we, at least in the physical sciences, like weather and climate, can we predict it? Can we get it right? And if you can do all of those, I would argue that we have some degree of understanding. So spoiler alert for climate, yes, 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 and yes. Uh, so that's, that's a piece you need to know, but I'll go through for a couple minutes. Another way to look at it, any idea what this thing is? If especially anybody under 40? A sextant, yes. Yes, it's a sextant. Why do I have that up here in the middle of a climate brief? Well, one of my most fun jobs in the Navy was actually on my first ship, I got to be the navigator. And again, it's hard for young people to remember this or realize this, but there was a time in which you didn't just pick this thing up and find out where you were to within two meters of the world. And you actually, this is what we used on the ship to go figure out where we were. So what I learned pretty quickly as a navigator is unless you wanted to be a Walmart greeter rather unexpectedly, uh, you paid attention to all the observations, but you didn't lock on to any one individual use the stuff in between your ears to kind of integrate. And that's kind of how we look at climate too. When the, when the head of the Navy, Admiral Gary Ruffett, asked me to take a look at this, that was really the mindset. Let's look at everything. Let's not lock on to any one thing, but let's see what the big picture tells us. So, well, here's the first part. No, I'm not gonna make you derive it. No, there's not a quiz, not for this class. Uh, I know, thank God for that, right? So, you know, some people ask me, you know, when I was doing this in the Pentagon, it's like, Titley, did you get religion? And it's like, no, I just went to the Church of the Radiative Transfer Equation. You know, but this stuff has been known for a long time. I tell people, you know, sometimes this is old, dead guy, white science. That's what it is. Uh, so the guy on the left is Fourier. So anybody who's done Fourier series, it's that kind of Fourier, 1820s. Uh, he figured out that the temperature of the Earth would be quite different if there was no atmosphere. The, uh, the guy in the middle, Scott, is uh, Tyndall. And Tyndall is the one, basically he was doing these public experiments in London that honestly were like the TED Talks of the 19th century. He had these really cool pieces of 19th century apparatus. And he was able to show that not only was it the atmosphere, but it was carbon dioxide. He would like show there's no difference in temperature with oxygen or with nitrogen, but when you put in CO2, you get this huge difference. And by the time you get to the guy on the right, a Swede, a Reinhus, he was actually figuring out, based on the Industrial Revolution, how much we were changing the climate. Now, he underestimated the amount of CO2, but he had the basic idea right with pencil and, and paper. So you had a Frenchman, a Scot, a Swede. As best I know, they did not go into a bar. But by the end of the 19th century, 
we kind of had this. And that's why I say this is, frankly, the theory is, is cutting edge 19th century science for the basics. OK, so we've got that. Here are some observations. If you've seen this, my apologies. If you haven't, it's kind of cool. It comes from my friends at NASA. And let me, let me just tell you what you're going to see before I start running it. So I hope you can see here's a year. And that's going to cycle through up to 2012. Uh, and what these are based on is basically NASA took all the thermometers, basically at the surface of the Earth, and averaged them out. And for each year, we figure out uh, whether it's blue or whether it's orange. And that's based on how does that temperature at that place compare to the average of the 20th century, so 1900 to 1999. And if it's blue like this, it was colder at those places, but not everywhere. You can see there's part of Africa, part of like the Gulf Coast, a little bit warmer even back then. But you'll see how it changes. So again, these are just observations. Uh, and, and we'll see if this runs. Yes, here we go. So I'll write it a couple of times. But here we, here we come, up to 1900. It's kind of cool to watch the dust bowl, because we know that's really hot in the US. So here's World War I, 1920. Here comes 1930, watch the dust bowl here, in the, in the 30s, there you are. But you saw the whole world wasn't orange, it was just parts. So 1940s, <coughs> World War II, into the 50s, into the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Make it through Y2K, oh, we made it, 2000, and 2012. And if I can get somebody, it was wonderful when I was a senior officer in the Navy, I could have like, somebody go get this for me, but I'm not technologically, well, I'm technologically challenged, so I haven't updated it. But the last few years would be warmer still, because they've been setting, setting records. Uh, what you kind of see from this is, remember, this is not a projection. This is not what somebody thinks might happen at some point. This is just what is. And if we had time, we could spend the rest of the day, we could spend a week going through all the other, what we would call in science, independent lines of evidence. What does independent line of evidence mean? See, I'm a, I'm a professor, so I can't, I can't help myself from asking questions. So what that is, is it means it doesn't depend on the other thing. So like if we can look at, the temperatures, and somebody says, ah, that's NASA. You know, those guys, they fixed the data to make it look like this. OK, fine. One, they didn't. Uh, I worked in the government for 35 years. The government's not good enough to run a conspiracy like this. I can tell you that. We'd screw it up. We just aren't good enough. But that's another story for another day. But you know, go look at then how spring comes earlier. You know, how the birds come, you know, migrating birds come earlier, how the flowers bloom earlier how the leaves fall off the trees later. So I mentioned, you know, I'm at Penn State. I did my undergrad there. I've noticed the leaves fall off the trees about two weeks later now than they did when I was an undergraduate. That's just what they do. You know, they did not get the word from NASA that they're part of the conspiracy. So that's, that's independent data. And we could go on and on and on. So there's the observations. And finally, can we predict this stuff? OK, so I got two, two sets of predictions here. The top left again, from NASA, if it looks like it's a PDF of a Xerox of a PDF of a Xerox, it's because it is. It actually comes out of a scientific journal from 1980. I know, most of the people here, it's like, that's like when the Fleet's Flintstones were around. It's like, not quite that bad, but it was a long time ago. And there was this guy named Hansen, Jim Hansen, not the Muppets guy, the climate guy. Uh, and he basically took the climate models of the time of the late 70s, and he said, hey, let's see what happens. And let's see what happens. Let's see if I got a pointer on this. Yes, I do. What he came up with were these black lines. And after about 20 or 30 years, he had to make some assumptions on how much greenhouse gases we were still going to do. But that was what Hansen came up with. And he published it. It's, I think, in the journal Science, actually, or GISS. And uh, yeah, Science. So about 40 years later, some bright person said, hey, let's see how that guy Hansen actually did. And that's what that magenta line is. And if you can see anything, I don't know if you see that, but the line has a very similar characteristic. It's actually a little higher, which means a little warmer. So technically, was Hansen right? No, he was wrong because he was too cold. 
but I would argue that was very useful. You may have heard the phrase from, actually comes from a British statistician in the 70s, all models are wrong, but some are useful. I would argue that was pretty useful, what he came up with. Okay, so we could do that, and we could do that like 40 years ago. So let's fast forward now to the, what's called the IPCC, the Intergovernment, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They run a big set of computer models about every six, seven, or eight years, depending on exactly their, their time sequence. These are the ones that were run a few years ago. They were run in 2000. So everything to the left, we knew the answer. So you don't get a ton of credit for being right when you know the answer. It's like kind of like that open book test where you can just look stuff up. But everything to the, I'm sorry, to, to the left was we knew. To the right, after 2000, we did not know. So how to read this is the black is the average, the gray is what we would call the spread. That basically means it should be somewhere in the gray, but definitely around the black. And all the colored lines are different places all the way from Japan to NASA to NOAA to the British, uh, figuring out the temperatures. And you can kind of see in 2015, they're back on here, 16 and 17, they're actually a little above. So the models, and you, this is important to know, the models do not, climate models do not, do not tell you year-to-year -year variability. The climate models do not tell you, oh, I'm going to have an El Nino in the year 2037 or it's gonna be a La Nina in 2039. They don't tell you that. They do tell you when you average all that kind of, the fancy term is internal variability, sloshing back and forth of the ocean and the atmosphere, they tell you what the general trend is, like Hansen had. And we can do that. So again, we understand the theory, we've understood it for 150 years, we have plenty of observations, and we can predict it. So that's my science piece. I'm not going to do really much more anymore on the science. But when I hear people wanting these debates on science and all of this, it's a proxy argument, OK? It's an argument so that people can avoid having a discussion about policy and about what to do. All right, so at the end of all this, I have a somewhat rhetorical question. Do I believe in climate change? And I don't mean just believe. I mean, do we believe in climate change? So let me see, show of hands for who believes in climate change. Oh, I get you guys every time. I'm sorry. It's a cheap rhetorical trick. I don't. I am convinced by the evidence, though. But science is not a belief system. That's kind of what we figured out in the Age of Enlightenment, right? That we would be informed by the data and by testing hypotheses and seeing where the evidence leads us. So I am absolutely convinced there is overwhelming evidence that we have climate change. But I would argue that belief systems are maybe something we might do on a Friday night or a Saturday night or a Sunday morning, maybe at a house of worship or something like that. Uh, so so I, I get this question every day. Do you believe in climate change? It's like, no but I'm convinced by the evidence. I know, that's a cheap trick, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's talk, let's move on and let's talk about climate, you know, and some of the issues, why does this make it a security issue? You've probably heard it framed in environmental terms or sustainable terms, but why security? So there is something in the military, Joe would know this, we call bottom line up front. Why is that? Because, and I can say this because I was, <laughs> Admirals and generals are usually mm, sort of average intelligence, maybe a tad above, maybe a tad below, but they collectively have the attention span of a gnat. So if you don't tell them really fast like why it is they should pay attention, they will either find something else to do or start playing with their emails from their boss or whatever. So you kind of want to tell them just quickly, it's like get to the point. So this is my get to the point slide. Uh, and this is what climate and security risk is about. If the operating environment changes, what that means is it will be, if we do not adjust and anticipate for that, it becomes harder for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines to do their job because we may not have given them either the right training or the right equipment to work in those changed environments. And I would say the Arctic is the poster child for this, but certainly not the only one. Impacts to infrastructure. What's the American way of war? We work with the, the Army War College here. You probably, a number of you have probably had some sort of security studies. And you know that our way of war is we do not want to fight the home game, right? We want to fight the away game over there. So how do we do that? How do we make sure we're ready? 
we use our bases, we use our training ranges to have the most realistic training we can try to put together to stress our forces and to make sure that when we send them downrange, they are as ready as they can be. If those bases, be it Norfolk, be it Army installations, be it Air Force bases, are either going underwater on the coast or if they have drought issues and if every time you conduct a live fire mission, you set the range on fire, the neighbors tend not to like that. Uh, if you have flash flooding and it takes out a lot of your infrastructure, I was talking to the Army two-star Major General up in Alaska. Uh, his issue is forest fires. Not that his soldiers are being asked to put them out, but so much smoke now for many, many more days than they used to have, it really impacts doing high physical intensity exercises, both for the health of his soldiers, also things like flying helicopters around at very low levels, unless you have advanced avionics, that can be pretty dangerous in a lot of smoke. So all of those things then can really delay training. And you can imagine if you've either worked with the military, you know, go talk to any of the officers at the Army War College, when you're getting ready to deploy, your boss, that three star, ultimately the four star in the combatant command, he's not saying, hey, you know, if the, if the George Bush aircraft carrier, if you guys get ready in 2019 sometime, could you come over to the Persian Gulf? That would be nice. It, it doesn't work like that. It's like, on this date, you guys better be ready. And if you're not ready, we'll find somebody who gets them ready on that time. So there's a lot of pressure to do this in the time frames. That's the infrastructure. Making bad situations worse, climate is rarely, if ever, the reason why something falls apart. But it is usually in concert either reaching a threshold, like think of Sandy, right, when the water went into the subway, that was a threshold. All of a sudden, you got an extra $3 billion worth of damage. Uh, a threshold would be it's gone from not having much water to no water. That would be a threshold. But then, how does that government respond? Do they make it better? Do they bring in aid, international relief? Do they work to try to, uh, to minimize the pain from their, from their citizens, from people who are living there? Or do they ignore it? Or even worse, do they use that to exacerbate perhaps already existing tensions, ethnic tensions, sectarian violence, whatever. So there's a, it's a lot of stuff that's pretty complicated in this, but climate can be one of the stressors, and depending on both how bad it is and what the response is, uh, you can see things go south really, really quickly. That's, that's what the clim climate and security risk is about. I'll go through these things in a little bit of detail, but that's, that's what it is. Changes to the operating environment, impacts to infrastructure, making bad things worse. Let me just go through, so in case you think, hey, t you know, this is like some retired guy who's like just, we don't really know what he's doing and why he's talking about this. So I'm not the only one who talks about this stuff, so pardon for the acronym, but I see, anyone know what I see means here? Intelligence community. It's the U.S. intelligence community. And this is actually out on the web. Anybody can Google it. Uh, really catchy title, Implications for U.S. National Security of Anticipated Climate Change. Came out in September of 2016. And uh, while they have more than three things, they don't have, they got six things. So I can't remember them all, but I can put them up there. Kind of what I've talked about. Stability, social tensions, food, health, uh, competitiveness, and then there could be surprises that we just don't know what they are. That's what the intelligence community talks about. And somebody might say, well, yeah, but that was in the Obama administration. They were probably just told to say that. Well, okay. Fast forward to about three weeks ago. So today's intelligence community, uh, Director Coates, Dan Coates, testified to Congress on worldwide threat assessment and here's page 16 and 17, and again, you can Google it. Uh, and it's really the same stuff. He talks about uh, warming climate with social uh, uh, discontent and potential upheaval. He talks about water scarcity. He actually adds some things that the Obama administration did not talk about, like how fast we are uh, extinct, uh, species are going to extinction. So the biodiversity is kind of collapsing. That's a new, a new part in this. So I would argue that irrespective of administration, the, the professionals in the, in the intelligence community see this as an issue and continue to talk about it publicly. 
Here's another way to look at this. Uh, and again, this is really a slide that I put up for about 70 heads of navies. Uh, uh, one of the chiefs of naval operations, Admiral Jonathan Greener, asked me to come up to Newport, Rhode Island, so, so that other war college, and uh, basically ha spend half a day talking to pretty much every Navy who talks to the U.S. Navy at their number one or number two uh, admiral about the maritime risks of climate change. And this is kind of what I base that talk off of. And again, capacity. We all sort of understand that. How much do you have? Readiness. Readiness means not only do I have you know, tanks and ships and aircraft and people, are they gonna do what you need them to do in the most austere environment when somebody's shooting back? That's readiness. Uh, and where do we have, have issues there? And then new missions means just what, it, just what it says. So again, you can certainly, those are my personal check marks. Somebody else could put them in different places. But again, this is a way to sort of think about climate as security in a way that somebody who likes studies hard security would understand, as opposed to let me hug trees and save whales and, and things like that. Nothing wrong with that, but if it's talked about in an environmental issue, it tends to get discounted by the, by the hard security professionals. For better or worse, it just, it just is. Okay, let me talk about the Arctic just a little bit. So basically, I think it was about 1995 on the left, uh, 2016 on the right. If you look, all that dark blue, there's still a lot of ice. This is, this is at the end of the ice season, so like in March, actually, uh, right, right about now. A lot of blue, but there was a lot of white. That white was all the really old, hard, what we would call multi-year ice. Very thick, very hard ice. Stayed up there for years. Look at now, and in fact now there's even less white than, than there was two years ago. It's all but gone. So this is a massive change in, in the physical environment of the Arctic in, frankly, a quarter of a century, in just about all of our lifetimes. This has changed. It's not maybe, could be, someday. It's changed. So how are we going to deal with that? Well, one of the things is we're opening up trade routes uh, fairly rapidly. I don't know if anybody saw the news story, but uh, there was a uh, liquid natural gas tanker that went from Norway to China across the uh, top of Russia on that red line called the Northern Sea Route. And uh, they did it in February. And you're all saying, yeah, OK, that's interesting. They did it with no icebreaker in February, in the Arctic. It's like, wait a second, February, Arctic. You know, could you have done that you know, 25 years ago? Probably not. Now, there's just not that much old, hard ice. So we're seeing these open up. I think in about 15 years or so, we'll start seeing this green line open up. And that takes you away from all the territorial waters, and whether it's internal waters or a strait, or there, and there's all kinds of sort of legal aspects that are fascinating, but I'm not going to, I don't have time to go through them. But I can see that green line starting to open up, and that will be, you know, pardon the cliche and, and sloppy thinking, but, you know, sort of the proverbial game changer. That will start to uh, significantly alter trade routes. Probably not until then. So it's not going to be this year. It won't be next year. 10 to 15 years, though, I think we'll start seeing that. Uh, the Russians are certainly building back military capability in, on their islands north of them. Anybody do Russia studies? Somebody's got to do Russia studies. So Russians. You know, looking for win-win situations and we can all benefit or zero-sum paranoia, I win, you lose, you lose, I win, yeah. So, you know, they kind of, from what I can tell, talking to Russians as well as people who, scholars who study them, is the Russians are really, you know, for a thousand years, for a millennia, they've had their northern flank as being ice covered and they haven't had to worry about it. And now that's melted out. And they're kind of worried about it. They think, when I talk to them, they think the West is going to come across the Arctic. I have to tell them, look, in America, we can't find the Arctic Ocean. I don't think you have to worry about it too much. But they, but, you know, but the Russians are Russian, and they're pretty paranoid. So they're building a bunch of stuff. They're building, a, like, so, say, search and rescue bases. But search and rescue bases with 150 nautical mile surface to air missile batteries on them. It's like, maybe they're trying to generate business for search and rescue. I'm not sure. But uh, they have that. 
You know, so the U.S., we watch this very closely along with our allies, Canadians, Norwegians, Swedes, Finns, Danes. Uh, probably not in and of itself a huge threat, but we certainly want to watch to see what the Russians are doing. Uh, this is uh, a picture not out of episode two of Star Wars, but actually on an island called Svalbard. I don't know if anybody's been to Svalbard. A few people maybe have. Uh, 80 degrees north. It's up off the northeast coast of Greenland. It's mostly Norwegian, but there was something called the 1922, I think it was, Treaty of Svalbard, 21 or 22, post-World War I. Basically gives the Norwegian Svalbard, but not entirely. So other countries can have research, quote unquote, bases there. The Chinese have research on this island. The Russians have a lot of research on this island. Uh, the Americans do not. I think we should. Uh, and the issue is here a couple things. One, if you want to talk to every polar orbiting satellite on every orbit, this is where you go. It's Svalbard. That's what these domes are for. They can communicate with every single polar orbiting satellite every time. There's really no place else in the world we can do that. Not even, not even uh, uh, McMurdo Sound is, is far enough south for that. The other issue for here is Svalbard is actually between Svalbard and Norway is where the Russian Navy needs to get to before they even get to the GIUK gap. So strategically, if the Russians want to, need to, feel they must get to the warm waters of the Atlantic, they got to go through here. When you look at the Russian uh, defense documents, Svalbard is way inside their bastion, their line of defense. Uh, now, as I said, there's this treaty of Svalbard, so it's not quite Norwegian. But the Norwegians think it's Norwegian. And Norway is part of what? NATO, right? And what does NATO, at least we think it still has, Article 5, I think? Uh, so attack on one is an attack on all. Well, I asked my State Department friends, this is back when we used to have a State Department, do, uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. But do we, you know, do we recognize Svalbard as no kidding Norway? And would an attack on this be considered? And it's like, hmm, that's an interesting question. Well, we might want to talk to the Norwegians and let them know before they get themselves in trouble, if they ever got themselves in trouble. So this is a part of the Arctic. And oh, by the way, as the ice melts and human activity, they now have like 50,000, like 50,000 people around Svalbard. OK, I'm going to, I could talk about Greenland. Greenland wants to go independent. Uh, the oil prices came down a lot. That's how they were going to do it. It costs a lot of money. But my buddies in China are really, really interested in trying to help Greenland. We basically ignore them because when I, again, talk to the State Department, it's like, oh, they love us. They'll, they'll be with us if they ever go independent. It's like, really? When was the last time you talked to them? How do you know that? Well, nobody does because we ignore them, because we assume. And that's not what the rest of the world is, is doing. Infrastructure. Any idea where this place might be? Diego Garcia, probably a couple people have heard of it. Uh, another strategic island just south of the equator in the Indian Ocean, southwest of India. Uh, it is British, believe it or not, but the Brits let us, us being the DOD, do anything we want there, and it has supported arguably every significant military operation in Southwest Asia over the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, I spent a week there one day, and I would say it's about two meters at the highest point. So I have asked in the Pentagon, hey, what happens when this goes underwater? And almost without exception, the answer is, oh, look at the time, I have another meeting. Uh, why? Because it's really, really, really expensive. To You could spend $10 billion and replace about 40 or 50% of the capability with a floating base. There are other islands, but they are sovereign nations. And there's no way those nations are going to let us do everything the Brits let us do. So this gets hard. And I've asked the DOD to at least understand what is the relative rate of sea level rise there. Uh, Kwajalein, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. But you know, Kwajalein, the Air Force, they're building a big space fence. They thought of everything, big, big environmental impact study, except sea level rise. So bottom line, a 50-year lifespan, if we're lucky, we'll get 20 out of it. But it's only a billion dollars, right? So it hardly counts. OK, Norfolk, uh, ships go out for avoiding a hurricane, that's great, naval oceanography, that was my thing, hey, we made the right call, get them out of there. 
All the sailors go down to get on the ship. Nothing like kissing your spouse saying, hey, enjoy the hurricane, I'll be gone for a few days. That, that always goes over well. And uh, well, you left your car in fleet parking and yeah, there were a lot of unhappy sailors when we came back. Why do I show this? It's taking weaker and weaker and weaker hurricanes to achieve the same effect because the base of the sea level is coming up and up and up. Humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, we do this really well. The issue becomes if we have to do it so much, does it start taking out from high-end war fighting? And it starts bringing in how do you better use allies? Who has the capacity to do this? Uh, every once in a while an idea gets floated. So far it has not been very popular, but do we actually have constabulary forces that this is what they would do? So far that's not where, where the U.S. is, but it's something to sort of keep an eye on. The U.S. military is as good as anyone in the world at getting into a place like this, because honestly, these people are just looking for some help. They are not shooting at you. Uh, and we're very good with intelligence and logistics and helicopters and all this stuff. But if you do this a lot, it starts detracting from other missions that we need to do. Okay, Syria, I kind of mentioned this. Uh, and this is one of these places in which we had a combination, and it really goes back 40, 45 years, all the way from uh, a place where, where Assad got into power in the 70s, wanted to be... Uh, wanted to be self-sufficient in wheat and barley. You know, and you would hope that an advisor would say, hey boss, you know, we're in the Eastern Mediterranean, kind of dry here, maybe not the best idea in the world. But instead, I think what the advisor said, boss, you are a smart, powerful, and handsome man, and we'll get right on that. And by God, that, that would never happen here. Uh, and by God, that, you know, they did that. And by the 90s, they were self-sufficient. Uh, but they did it at a cost. They drained their aquifers, they drained their rivers, so it's like seeing the you know, neighbor with the RV and the really big boat and the three skidoos in the driveway, but where did they come from? There's nothing in the bank account but a big credit card bill. And there were things that had nothing to do with climate change. So like the Iraq war in 2003, a million refugees from Iraq come into Syria. And then you have about a decade ago a very, very bad drought that we can attribute the intensity of that drought to the change in climate. So now, in addition to having a million refugees in those cities that Saddam, I mean, Assad, excuse me, is not taking care of, you have three quarters of a million farmers who have nothing, just nothing, dust. And they go to the cities. So now you have nearly two million between internally displaced people and refugees in the cities and again, Assad is just kind of whooping up on these people, right? Fomenting already existing ethnic and sectarian tensions, and we have a catastrophe. We have a humanitarian catastrophe. We have, I would argue, a geopolitical catastrophe. Russia's back in the Eastern Mediterranean. Who would have thought that five years ago? And so on and so on. And there is no clear end game, and there's certainly no, nothing obvious that says any of this was good. So climate here, and this is kind of important, it did not cause Syria by itself. My friend Senator Sanders said climate change caused Syria. With all due respect, Senator, you're wrong. My other friend, Senator Cruz, uh, he said climate change has nothing to do with Syria. With all due respect, Senator Cruz, you're wrong. It was a link in a chain of events. And if you could break those links, you could potentially have mitigated or even avoided Syria, at least mitigated but those links all were there, and climate was one of those links. Okay, I'm gonna, I was gonna talk about migration. We can do that in the uh, Q&A if anyone's interested in migration, but uh, I need to keep going here. So first thing you gotta do is admit you have a problem, right? Step one of the recovery program. You know, Secretary Mattis, I think, has done this as well as he can given this administration. In his, uh, what we call, questions for the record response to uh, Congress in his confirmation hearing, he said, hey, absolutely, climate is changing, we know why, it's human caused, it is a risk to security, my job as Secretary of Defense is to manage risks and this is one of the risks I'll manage. That's probably about the best you could say given that his boss was not saying that at the, at the time. Uh, leadership counts. And we had the reason I got to do climate change is because that guy on the top right there, he was the CNO, Chief of Naval Operations, uh, and he asked the question, 
is the Arctic change going to be a big deal and does it portray anything larger? And we have a saying in the military that if your boss is interested, you are fascinated. So when the head of the service or a four star asks these questions, there are a lot of people who kind of say, hey boss, that's an interesting thought. Admiral Locklear talked very eloquently about this in March of 2013. It earned him uh, from Hawaii, he was the commander of Pacific Command, it earned him an all expense paid trip back to the House of Representatives. And in his very suave and debonair four star way, he basically told the House, did I stutter? Uh, but he said it's so much nicer than that. But he was basically saying that. And the guy on the left is a guy named Jim Langevin. He is a currently serving member of the House, uh, Rhode Island. And he actually inserted an amendment into the defense bill for this year uh, that got passed, believe it or not, that basically tells the DOD you need to pay attention to this. And against all odds, the House of Representatives, yes, that House of Representatives, passed it. And it got put into the bill, and it survived conference, and it was signed by the president. So the Department of Defense is now actually has quite specific language on how to take this seriously from the guys that write the checks. So they pay attention to the Congress. So leadership counts. Okay, one person. Let me, let me just tell you, you know, it's like, hey, this is all nice, but you know, I'm not a four star. I'm not a member of Congress. What can I do? So I have my llama, and yes, I know, somebody told me they were alpacas. I'm sorry, but it's as close to a llama as I can find. And it just stands for, yeah, alpaca llama. I don't have an acronym for alpaca, but I do for llama. And it basically is learn, local action, monitor, and advocacy. The learn, this does not mean make all of you Mike Mann. This does not mean you have to become climate scientists and extraordinaire. There is something called, from the American Association for Advancement for Science, what we know. Just Google, triple A-S, what we know. It's about 12 pages, it's in color, there are pictures. And if you read that, you will know basically as a citizen pretty much everything you need to know. If you want more than that, go to the National Academy of Science and it's called Climate Change Evidence and Causes. That'll take you to the 99th percentile of like everything you need to know. You will be the most informed citizen and people will love having you at their Thanksgiving table. Uh, that's all you need to know. They're really thin, easy, and they were intentionally written for non-scientists to be very accessible, especially the AAAS one. Uh, that's, that's all, and that just gives you the basic facts that you need. Local action, and what I tell people is do what you can within your lifestyle. Everybody here has a different life, a different background, different constraints. Uh, I'll give you an example. When my wife and I moved up to Penn State for the same amount of money, I could have bought a pretty big house about six or seven miles from campus, or I could have bought a slightly smaller, slightly older house within a 15 minute walk of my office. Same money. So I had that opportunity and I went with plan B. I went with the, the house that was smaller so that when I'm at Penn State, my transportation carbon footprint is zero. And we put some money into better insulation and double panes. Also, I hate paying Penn State parking money ticket. Anyways, I had to do that as an undergrad. Turns out, I don't know if Dickinson's like this, but you cannot get your transcript from Penn State unless you've paid your parking tickets. I don't know, I'll bet the provost can address that. So, yeah, okay. Ah, okay, well there we go. Okay, they, they come here, not Penn State. Okay, so, so their local action. Monitor, two ways. If you're in the science community, the, it, you cannot run the earth backwards in time. So it's very important regardless of policies that we have the satellites and the instrumentation to monitor what's going on on the earth. Because if you don't know, you don't know. Monitor can also be not only what your politicians are saying, but what they are doing. And finally, advocacy. And the way I put this is just very simply asking, ma'am, sir, at any level, what are you doing to stabilize the climate? So it's an open-ended question, not like, you know, sort of like dating 101. Don't ask yes or no questions. Uh, and you might get a thoughtful answer. You might not. But what you do get is at the very least, in the back of that politician's mind, one of their constituents asks this question. And believe me, they are sensitive to what people care about in their district. We all make fun of the politicians, but they got there for a reason. And they got there by having a pretty good pulse on their district. Uh, I tell people, 
Congress will not lead on this issue, but they absolutely can be led. It's not a perfect analogy, but kind of look at what happened to gay rights, okay? The politicians were scrambling to catch up with the population. They didn't lead. They were led, and they quickly figured out when this issue flipped, and yes, I know it took years and years of work not, not debating that, and yes, it's not a perfect analogy, but things can change. Even issues that might look hopeless can change, and when they change, they go fast. And what I tell people is you have to be ready for catastrophic success when that happens. Okay, energy, just one slide. We're actually today in the America in, I would argue, the fourth energy transition. We went to wood. We were 100% wood. We were almost 100% coal. Then we went to oil and gas. And I would argue that we are just starting to transition to renewables, non-carbon-based power. The question is going to be, will government policies make that faster or will they make that slower? So yes, we can. We do have some impact on the slope of those curves. So basically, how fast do we do this? We can either pretend it's not happening or we can embrace it and move it on. So again, what are you doing to uh, stabilize the climate? All right, this is really, this is risk management, you know, especially when I talk to the Pentagon. They deal with risks all the time, and a lot of them are actually less well known than climate. We, we have to figure out the, the risks. So I've talked a lot about sort of esoteric 50,000 foot stuff. Let me just make this a tad more personal. So when I was running the Navy's weather, operational weather and ocean prediction program, it was down in uh, Mississippi. And this is the house we lived. We were about three houses up from the, uh, from, the, from the Gulf of Mexico. It was about a 20 mile drive into work and that's where we lived. So if you ever wonder what a nine meter storm surge does coming up your street, that's me on the right. And that was the very first time we got back after Katrina. So when we say our house was gone, to this day, we don't know whether it's up there in the railway tracks or over there in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, because it's not like I cleaned up the lot and then took the picture. This is what it looked like. So we really did lose our house. Uh, the good thing, though, is if you look at the concrete stuff in the background, that was the ugliest house on the street, so I'm hoping that mine came off its foundations, knocked down the ugly house, and, and that's actually okay for me. I, I show this not for sympathy in many ways that I don't have time to get into. We, we were arguably the luckiest people on the Mississippi coast, but think of the millions of people around the world who have nothing when something like this happens. And if they are young and male and have nothing, that can become a security problem. If they are not taken care of appropriately by their governments, that can become a security problem. So these are happening, and you don't even have to assume anything about whether hurricanes and typhoons are getting stronger or whatever. Just the fact that these are coming in on higher and higher sea levels makes this kind of damage more and more likely as we go on. So let me just close with a couple of quotes here. Uh, Yes, I'm Navy. I know it's, we're near the Army War College, but I think Admiral Nimitz, and nobody's accused Admiral Nimitz of being a tree hugger, you know, kind of had some pretty good words here. Now, this was after Admiral Halsey ran a uh, battle group through a typhoon, uh, sunk three ships, killed 700 sailors. It was, at that time, the worst loss the Navy had since Pearl Harbor. But nothing's more dangerous than begrudging taking precautions. I would argue we should be taking some precautions with, with the climate risk here. This gentleman here is alleged to have said, turns out he didn't actually say anything, but he's alleged to have said uh, that Americans can always be counted upon to do the right thing after exhausting every other possibility. So I think we're still exhausting them right now, but we will, we will get there. And this is really where I prefer to think of it, is when we are focused in this country, we do amazing things. Uh, this comes out of, for those of you of a certain age, you probably recognize this as out of... Uh, Apollo 13. And, you know, the more you read about that, I was a relatively small kid at the time, the more you realized those astronauts should have died in space. There's no way they should have come home alive. And we, we didn't let that happen. We can do amazing things when we get focused. We are not focused on this issue, very frankly, right now. When we get focused, we can do amazing things, and I, and I hope that will happen. So thank you very much, and uh, I guess we all get to eat. I'm happy to take questions, whoever's running this, however, however we're doing it. Thanks very much. Yeah, sure. I'm
I'm happy to do that. Yeah, okay. okay, so I think what we're going to do is we'll take maybe for those who just can't wait and they've got to ask the question now, uh, we'll do two or three questions and then I'm told and I'm very happy to do this maybe after we've all got a chance to eat, maybe after 20, 30 minutes or so, I'll be happy to take, take some additional questions and maybe you'll think of something as you're, as you're talking to your uh, table mates there. Okay. And if you have a question, wait for a microphone so we're recording this. Or maybe nobody wants to be that one person before lunch uh, asking a question. Or two, he can wait a long time. For oh, worse yet, I start asking questions. Um, hi, I was wondering um, maybe like if you could talk a little bit about what you think the responsibility is uh, for developing countries and Western countries to take action on climate change. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, we'll play multiple Phil Donahue's here. Uh, yeah, it's it's a great question, and I think this these are these are the things that on the policy side, you know, if we don't get it right, it becomes a security issue, right? Now, what is the right answer? I mean, that's that's a topic of very hot debate, and it's really where you stand is where you sit. Uh, if you're a developing country, you can make a tremendously powerful argument saying, look, I contributed about two percent, maybe. 1%, 2% of the greenhouse gases, and I'm getting 80% of the impact. You know, what's up? Uh, if you're in this country, it's like, hey, so sad, too bad, you know, I'll, I'll deal with me, maybe, you know, and you guys can deal with you. Uh, and, I mean, that's, those are almost caricatures of the positions, but I watched this. So I went to the uh, UN climate conference in Copenhagen, that was fun, in 2009, but I watched this play out with the African Union. I mean, and it, and it was almost that extreme on both sides. Um, basically, both sides have walked out. Uh, I, I really personally, and that's all this is, I really should have said this at the very beginning. These are all my personal views. I do not represent the US Navy. Uh, I don't represent American Security Project. I don't represent Penn State. They're just my personal views. But my personal view would be, is there some grand bargain in which the West helps, greatly helps, like like either gives or tremendous subsidies for non-carbon based power, you know, at let's say at a level of Western European capacity per person. So this is not like, oh, you have two hours of power a day. But power leads to education, it leads to clean water, it leads to better health. Education, especially of women, leads to lower fertility rates and, and tremendous increases in quality of life for everybody. So I would, I would personally look at this as how does the West do that? And that's hard, right? I mean, even if you build it, it's gotta be maintained, which means how do you make sure that you have enough training so that, so that these systems don't just rust out, right? A lot of well-meaning people have tried these. So to say that the devil is in the details is an understatement, but I would look at some kind of how do we uh, assist the, the components of the world that either have no power or unreliable power or carbon-based power to get to non-carbon and not make them pay for that. And is that, because that helps, helps fix everything, right? You, you get non-carbon power at scale and you are basically providing, and, and again, you can argue, certainly people can argue, is that a gift or is that a retributions payment? And, and I'm gonna not come down on either side, but I would think things like that. But again, you know, there, there can be a whole course on this and there are people who really work this stuff that could probably come up with 15 reasons why that's a bad idea. Uh, but I would look at some kind of trading. Anyone else? There's at least one, there's one gentleman in the back. Somebody else, okay, whoever else. I don't mind. Students. All right, students get first. So how would you say um, stability operations will change uh, as climate change continues to become more of an issue? Yeah, so, so on the stability operations, I think, you know, you can look at places again, whether it's like Syria or like Arab Spring, uh, not all places are going to be impacted all the time. It's really important to understand what are the root causes, and a lot of these 
issues can be, can be help affect, uh, addressed by good governance. Uh, you know, I tell people while we had the really bad drought in, in Syria, you know, we also had almost as bad a drought in California, but we don't have ISIS wandering around, you know, Los Angeles and San Francisco. So for the stability operations, really this is another stressor and it would probably be good and the intelligence community is trying to work on this. How do you predict where the next Syria is? I'm not sure that we can ever get to the perfect prediction, but can you at least see where the risks are and it's either because of climate stressors, again, looking at it relative to a threshold and you gotta understand what are the specific thresholds for specific countries and is it happening inside them or is it more like Arab Spring? You know, where Arab Spring, the climate stressor was half a world away in China, Ukraine, Australia, put pressure on the wheat crop. China said, I'm gonna get wheat. They bought a lot of it on the commodities market. Prices shot up, but the place that buys the most wheat on the market is actually North Africa. And all of a sudden, they were not able to pay for that. So how do you, you've got to look at when you're doing stability ops, the, these very different impacts that might seemingly, seemingly come from nowhere. So understanding that and then sort of being sufficiently proactive to get to those root causes. So again, helping with good governments, helping with uh, transparent government to the degree you can, so that this looks like more fighting against, if you will, a common threat rather than pitting person versus person in different villages or, or towns. As a voter in Pennsylvania, I wonder if you could talk about Pennsylvania in particular, uh, where you think some of our climate stressors are and policy needs. So, okay, so for Pennsylvania, I think what we're gonna see here is uh, probably s mostly indirect. I mean, the part when I've talked to city managers sort of at the local and state levels, what I've talked about is, is within Pennsylvania, I worry about flash flooding, and we see these. I mean, I almost call them rain bombs, is you'll get a place, in fact, we just had two years ago, just, just north of State College, you pick up about seven inches of rain in an evening, and nobody's ever seen that before. I mean, I think it killed two people. Had it been in State College, we would have probably killed two dozen. Uh, so I asked cities, how are you, have you updated your, your swift water emergency rescue? And they're looking at me like, we've never done that. Well, well, you might. When public works is working, what kind of, di I mean, this is really super unsexy stuff, but what kind of diameters do you have for your stormwater? You know, maybe it can't all go down a culvert, but are there like fields in which it could drain into and then, and then do that? So we're gonna have to think about water in probably a different way. I think very low probability but high impact is we have a lot of forests in Pennsylvania. Uh, if we get real serious drought with high temperatures, uh, you gotta think about fires and are we prepared for major, a major fire, almost like the West kind of fire. Do, do you guys remember that fire in November around what was it, Dolly Parton's place, Gatlinsburg, whatever? You know, I mean that scared the crap out of me because you don't think of fires in Tennessee around Thanksgiving. So if it could happen there, could it happen here? Now, having said, said that, relative to so many places, though, in the U.S., I think we're in better shape. We have some issues on the Delaware estuary with sea level rise and saltwater intrusion, and there are, of course, a lot of people around Philly. Uh, but by and large, we don't have a huge sea level rise problem. Yes, it's going to get warmer, but our idea of warmer is more days in the 90s, not hundreds and 105 and 110 and 115. Uh, our idea of, it looks like we will get more or less the same amount of precipitation, maybe a little more. I don't think we're gonna have the same kind of drought issues that, that the South and the Southwest are gonna have. So I've actually talked to, there's a climate caucus, believe it or not, in the state legislature. And I've talked to them and I've talked to the Pennsylvania Mutual Insurance uh, Association how do you think about Pennsylvania as a climate refuge? How do you market that? How do you get all those people who left our state to go to the Sun Belt to realize come circa 2050 that they actually want to come and live back up here because it really sucks down there? Technical term. Uh, so 
I, yes, we have, we have challenges, and the water, if I was a local official or state official, I got to think about flash flooding and making people safe and thinking of how to, you know, warning systems, rescue systems, drainage systems. Uh, but relative to, to that, the agriculture is going to get stressed, but probably not to the point where it, it really collapses on us, at least not in the, you know, 20, 30, 50 years or so. So I think relative to a number of other locations in the country, we're in better shape, we still have issues, and we should think honestly, if we're thinking about Pennsylvania, how do we, how do we market that? Right, one last question. Lunch is so close. Thank you, sir. Uh, you mentioned uh, national security is ma primarily a, ma a matter of managing risk. Um, the most recent national security strategy released by the Trump administration largely omits climate change altogether as a uh, major risk in places, places its highest uh, emphasis on great power uh, competition. Uh, since, that, since that document's an underlying driver of budgets, um, where do you think our increased risk uh, with regard to much of what you've been talking about lies and how will we deal with that, particularly as we see more and more of our leaders in the administration being replaced with people who don't believe in those things. Sure. I mean, it, it's, it's absolutely a reality. There, there have been two, you know, sort of capstone documents, national security strategy, national defense strategy, that have both come out in the last two or three months or so. And, and both uh, climate is conspicuous by its absence. There, there's no denying that. Uh, when you listen to Secretary Mattis talk, he says, yes, it's still a risk. But I know from talking to senior people in the Pentagon, they tend to focus on what's in the national defense and national security strategies. Uh, so this is, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, and, and anybody who has worked or will work in the Pentagon, so if you will work in the Pentagon, here's a pro tip. You got to talk about your program in the language that is the currency of the day. You know, on, as of September 12th, 2001, everything was counterterror. On September 10th, that wasn't true. You changed, you changed how you talk about your program. So if I am talking about the Arctic now, I'm talking about it in terms of Russia and China. And China just put out a white paper uh, about six weeks ago on the Arctic. And they kind of say, hey, this is, you know, is going to be really good for us. You look at what China is doing in the Nordic states, in Greenland, in Iceland, in uh, Denmark. Now, I'm not trying to talk about this to say, oh my God, you know, there's, uh, there's you know, adversaries under every, you know, under every couch. But if you talk about it that way, you know, it, that, that gets attention, just as in the Obama administration, I would phrase things some other ways. The other part, you know, you mentioned the budget, and you're right, how the, not to make this, I know we're not inside the beltway, so I won't talk too much about budgets, but the budget is proposed by the executive branch, but who actually votes on it? The Congress, right? So the Congress, and I showed that guy Langevin, there, are, there is some evidence that the Congress is moving on the climate and security issue. I mean, I don't want to you know, go high-fiving everybody. It's like, ooh, we're done. But that budget will get written and modified as it comes across from the Pentagon by the Congress. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the budgets that just got passed in this last week, they have no resemblance to what this administration submitted. None. I mean, basically none. Uh, certainly when in the non-defense fields, they're, they're unrecognizable. In fact, they're more of an Obama budget than Obama ever got. So, for, for, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So, uh, would it be better if climate was in these capstone documents? Absolutely. Absolutely, but the glass is not empty, and there are ways to talk about it, and there are also ways of working with the Congress, who does not have necessarily buy-in into those documents, to help on this. And you know, in D.C., the, the, the baseball game is infinite innings. You always get another bat. You always are going to come up, and in four years or six years, those documents will get rewritten, and you get another at-bat, and, and we'll see where it goes.